I like to look at myself either, myself either as an advisor, um, a strategic partner for the most part, or um, just an athlete representative. The sanctioning bodies have put in place organized blood and drug testing for the professional fighters. I feel if that's going to be an importance, we have to do the same thing outside the ring to where we have the fighters protected and we have them informed about the business that they're in the same way that they're keeping the sport fair inside the ring. We have to do it outside the ring also for the professional fighters. My aim is to make sure that if I can't represent all the fighters all over the world, that my tactics of protecting yourself at all times, the principle of protect yourself at all times campaign, the boxer manager agreement, all those things fighters know about. So although they may not work with AC Sports Management or they may not be a part of what we're doing on a daily basis, they have the necessary tools to go forward in this sport and protect themselves from the business side of things until the business becomes associated and there's a union or council put in place. I'm doing what I need to do to make sure that the fighters are protected. Fighters have to understand the glaring difference in what they're paying in their overhead expenses compared to what NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, what they're paying their representatives as far as athlete representation. Boxing, you're looking at between 15 and 33% um, for representation. And then on top of that, you have a standard 10% for the trainers. But they say standard, but where does the standard come from? Who came up with those numbers when there's no union or no association of boxing? Who came up with those numbers? We know in the NBA, when a guy makes the league minimum of $874,000, we know he pays his representative 4%. We know in the NHL, when a player gets 575,000 league minimum, again, 4% for the representative. We know in NFL league minimum is $450,000. We know the athlete pays 3% max for his, his agent. And then the MLB, which is $507,000 league minimum, we understand that they pay 4%. So in an associated league with a union, the max is 4%. Lowest it goes is probably 1%. But in boxing, where there's no association and there's no union, you're paying between 15 and 33% for representation and then an added 10% for your trainer. The unions make sure that the agents are licensed. They make sure not only they do a background check, but they make sure that the credentials check out. Who have you worked for before? Uh, what contracts have you negotiated? All those things are checked off before they certify someone to represent the athletes in those associations. In boxing, you pay $20, $25, $50, $100 to the state commission who does a background check on you to make sure that you're not a criminal, and they certify you to represent these high dollar athletes. Let's take the NBA and the National Basketball Players Association uh, as an example. 1954, uh, Bob Cousy stood up for the professional basketball players to give them a voice. And what he did was go to the NBA's president and he demanded or he gave certain concessions to the, the NBA president uh, for the players to have benefits, for them to get more money in per diem, for them to have longer structured contracts with more money. There were certain things that he stood up for for the players because before that time, there was nothing put in place to give the players more. You look at it how it is right now with the NBA, what Bob Cousy did in 1954 was monumental to now you see guys getting record contracts, you see huge things for the players and they have health benefits, they have a pension after they retire. The Players Association for the NBA, for the NFL, for the MLB, for the NHL, it's monumental for the players because they have a voice uh, to go by. My name is Willie Monroe Jr. I'm from Rochester, New York, and I'm top five middleweight boxer in the world. Um, the toughest thing about being a professional boxer is the business. Um, fighting is the easy part. Um, it can be a little stressful um, on the family, being that I am married uh, with two kids and, and one on the way. Um, the financial aspect of it, obviously, we're talking business. Um, you know, a lot of fights are far and few in between, and it's, you just... Uh, you don't know when the next paycheck is coming, so you have to be smart. And you're paying so many people on the team, and you know you have to be really intelligent with how you spend your money, where you place your money, and oh, let's not forget taxes. Normally, most fighters, if you don't have a great amateur background, probably get a thousand dollars a fight when you first start. And the more you win, the more knockout, the more knockouts you get, 
And the more you be successful down the long run, and then that's when eventually you start getting bigger, bigger checks. Let's take $1 million. You're fighting for $1 million on a premium cable network like HBO or Showtime. And you're fighting for a world title within your particular weight class. Before you take home your check, there are several breakdowns that happen that you have to understand. The standard in the business, if you're paying your manager 33% of your purse, 33% of $1 million is $330,000. You're minus that for representation. You have to pay your trainer 10% of your purse, which is a million dollars, minus $100,000 for the person that's preparing you. To fight for a world title is not free. It's 3% of your purse, which is $30,000. In overhead expenses alone, you're minus $460,000 in overhead expenses, which means your take home is $540,000 before taxes. I was sleeping, I just woke up one day and uh, had a white curtain over my eye and uh, and didn't know what it was, you know, so I let it go a couple of days and, you know, and um, the curtain just got bigger and bigger. And so uh, I put my hand over my eye and all I saw was just my fingertips. And I'm like, oh, this just got real, this is serious. So I went to the eye doctor and they was, uh, they told me like, man, you got multiple breaks in your retina. They was like, we gotta have surgery right now or you're gonna lose your eye for good, man. So, you know what? I did not have insurance, man. I was so scared. I was wondering how I was gonna pay for all these um, surgeries, but you know, um, thank God that Parkland Hospital, they had insurance for people who didn't have insurance who needed major surgeries. So Parkland um, took care of all my eye surgeries, man. And so uh, that was the biggest blessing right there, man. When you don't have the next job lined up, it can be a little scary, you know? Be a little scary to, to know, can I keep a roof over my family's head? Um, can I keep the taxes paid? Can I keep my kids in the right school district that I've got them in to make sure they have the top education? You know, these are the questions that run through my mind every day. And I just fought two big fights, big networks. Um, one of them was pay-per-view and you know, after setting my family up and making sure everything is taken care of, you know, I have a wife, two kids, and one on the way. And um, I like to look at myself as an intelligent person. I've, I've made intelligent moves with my money, but we're in a position right now to where it's been a little over six months and, you know, no calls have been answered. The phone isn't ringing for fights. And now I'm in a position of, okay, I have another kid on the way. Um, I have some money put away. We have a roof over our head. We have uh, two cars and a lot of responsibility. The idea came from my passion for not only sports, but my passion for professional athletes. Um, I participated in football, basketball, boxing growing up. And um, when I was in college uh, for four years fighting in the amateurs, I learned so much about the sport of boxing, learned so much about discipline. I learned so much uh, about working with a team, although it's a uh, individual man sport you work amongst the team in um in the amateurs but that's where the passion started and instead of just following the norm of the sport of boxing and just signing a bunch of fighters and, and making money off of the fighters i've been through the struggle and i know how it is for fighters once they retire from the sport to literally die with nothing everything that you've made in the sport you sacrifice your life for the sport of boxing and by the time you retire you have absolutely nothing um it's hard to hear that story and it not hit home or not kind of tug at your heartstrings to say yo i want to make a difference or i want to be the difference for professional boxing so you take my passion for the sport and then you take my experience inside the ring you kind of put them together and that's where you get to protect yourself at all times campaign from that's where you get ac sports from everything i'm doing for the sport of boxing that's where you get it from, my passion tied in with my experience. You learn something different um, from a fighter's standpoint. You got that emotional roller coaster, the up and down, and then you learn about, I'm not making the same money I thought I was gonna make, or I gotta sign this contract, this for how long? The process of looking over a contract as an attorney is more than just you handing over a contract to me and me reading it and giving a response back. 
um, it kind of turns into a dialogue. And they always say communication is key, right? So with an attorney, I also want to make sure they're aware of things they never thought they should be aware of. For example, I know a contract I've seen in the promotional space um, dealt with intellectual property, which I was not aware would be in those contracts initially. But I look at a certain contract, and I won't name the promotional company, but they are essentially were asking the, the boxer for his intellectual property to his name and his brand. And to me, I don't think Golden Boy becomes Golden Boy without that name and that brand recognition. I don't think um, Floyd Mayweather makes the money he makes if he doesn't have a brand that he can associate with. If someone else took advantage of the money team, he wouldn't have the, um, the wealth that he has today. And so I wanna make sure that we lay it out early on that, hey, as a boxer, do you, are you aware you're giving that away right off the bat? There needs to be two separate agreements. The boxer manager agreement, that's the contract between the two that states, okay, you're gonna represent my professional career, these are your set duties, and this is how much I'm gonna pay you for that. On the opposite side, if the manager comes forth with a stipend or something to help the fighter like stay on his feet, let's say that number is $10,000 over the next 10 months, or so $1,000 per month, that's a separate loan agreement. That has nothing to do with our agreement between uh, between the two of us. So it actually benefits not only the fighter, but also the, the representative. You are insured a promissory note to get your money back with that $10,000. If you just rely on getting a higher percentage to get your money back, if the fighter gets clipped and he can't fight no more, you don't get your money back. So it needs to be separate. The boxing manager agreement needs to be put in place by the fighters. It protects them. When I was signed to a promoter and, and management, I looked at it as, I have a boss, not realizing I am the business, I'm the boss, and they work for me. And this still have the humility of knowing that I'm working with people and, and that people's jobs are important. But at the end of the day, I am the boss. I have the last say so in everything that goes on. You only can be as good as your awareness of your strengths and your weaknesses. So in boxing, if you know you have a weak jab, you're gonna work on that, or you're gonna make sure you're not exposed in that way. And that's the same thing involving with business and law, especially too, with your contract. If you don't know what you don't know, it's gonna hurt you. And if you do know what you don't know, make sure you correct that. Boxers are business owners because they're not employed by anybody in the sport of boxing. You're not employed by your promoter, nor are you employed by your manager. As an independent contractor in the sport, the promoters contract your services to fight. You come in and fight, win, lose, or draw, they hand you a paycheck. That's the business transaction. Same thing for your management. You contract them to negotiate, be the representative for your respective company. After you fight, again, win, lose, or draw, you hand them a paycheck, the business transaction is done. That's how boxers are business owners, independent contractors, and they have to act and move as such in this sport until something changes. My hope for this entire thing is that the fighters uh, learn the business for one, learn to have a voice in the business, and learn to move as a business owner uh, in, the, in the sport of boxing. But it comes with education and information. Uh, and currently in the sport of boxing, there is no education and there is no information uh, from the powers that be. So the Protect Yourself at All Times campaign is put in place to educate and inform the athletes and make sure that they're, um, they're safe and, for lack of a better phrase, protected. True innovation will come to the sport of boxing if the fighters come together with either a council or a union put in place to get certain things that they want. And when I say get certain things that they want, I'm talking in regards to a pension. I'm speaking in regards to health benefits. I'm speaking in regards to understanding the transition from coming into the sport of boxing from amateur to retiring to the, uh, from the sport of boxing. All those things will be put in place for the professional boxers, but they have to have a voice. They have to want to have a voice going forward uh, to make things happen for themselves. Innovation is key. Innovation is key with anything. If you look at the sport of basketball, football, baseball, hockey, tennis, badminton, uh, it's innovation. Uh, the sports are growing and technology is growing, and we have to do the same in the sport of boxing. Uh, the sport is very ancient and it's very rich, but we can't stick to the use tools. How things used to be, uh, it can't be put in place for how things are now and how they'll be going forward. Uh, we have to innovate and we have to educate ourselves and inform the athletes on how things are going to be going forward. Protect yourself at all times.
Protect yourself at all 